Hello, welcome beautiful people to this edition of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host and producer of the Happy Hour, and this is the show where we talk about how everything in Montpelier shakes out for the rest of us. And I am speaking this week with regular contributor Emily Kornheiser, as well as um, Anne Sosin, who is a policy fellow at the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and the Social Sciences at Dartmouth. Um, always a, a handful, Anne, but glad, glad you're here. You are also serving as the interim Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition Director. Um, so, so glad you can be joining us today. Um, we will be talking about healthy policy. So bear with me, folks. This is this is how I pitched it to the, the concept to Emily and Anne, and they're along for the ride. So this weekend was the Lunar New Year, as we're starting to enter the year of the rabbit. Uh, and so I was I was doing my feng shui practices. And it got me thinking about, you know, how with the new year, we always wish people a healthy new year and a happy new year and an abundant new year. And I just got thinking about those sentiments and wondering, like, what does that look like in policy? Like, if we were to craft happy, healthy, abundant policy, <laughs> what would that look like? <laughs> I love that Emily's giggling and Anne is smiling. Uh, and so I just threw that at them and we will see what that comes up with. Um, Anne, I would love to start with you and kind of like when I when I said that to you, what started percolating? Well, thanks so much for having me back on the show and happy new year to both of you um, this, this morning. Um, you know, I think a lot about what are the conditions necessary for health. Often we, when we think about health and what it takes to be healthy, we think about healthcare and healthcare systems, um, going to see um, the doctor. Um, but health is a lot more than that. Um, we um, know that really only about 20% of our health is shaped by the healthcare system. About 80% of health um, is shaped by um, forces that go far beyond the healthcare system. Sometimes we talk about these things as the social determinants of health. Um, we know um, that the places where we live, work, learn, um, the air we breathe, um, the water we drink, um, all ha influence our health um, in mirrored ways. Um, and so when I think about what it means to be healthy, I'm thinking about how do we shape those forces in ways that are conducive um, to health um, rather than in ways that undermine um, our health. Thank you, Anne. How about you, Emily? What what started percolating for you? Yeah, I think about um, when you first brought it up, I thought about New Year's resolutions and how deeply individualistic a New Year's resolution is. So instead of someone, you know, promising to themselves that they won't eat sugar in the new year, which seems like I think that's a thing people do, um, <laughs> it would be like, you know, I am committed to a state that has healthy options at every, you know, every stop for food, you know, the vending machine would not be a vending machine at the rest stop. It would be like a lovely cafe that offered me celery, celery to eat while I drive. Um, and I wouldn't actually even be driving my own car. I'd be on a train where I could communicate with other people and like, a lovely environment that felt relaxing and had clean air in it. Um, so I, I feel like I could go like a little, a little further on this fantasy that might be helpful for discussions of public policy. Um, <laughs> trains always feel like just like a gully too far into the dream, into the political dreaming around here. But um, oh, it is, I miss it be, public transport. Yes. Yes. But it would really, it's like looking at social and public solutions to what we constantly especially in sort of New England's Puritan roots um, are thinking of as individual problems with individual solutions and individual responsibilities. Um, so it would be a state that was committed to family medical leave universally. It would be a state where everyone has a safe place to sleep at night. 
and a kitchen to cook a meal for their family and has the skills and the time to do that. And ways to heat their home that don't contribute to asthma and all kinds of things. So that would be, it would also be when I make my new, I'm really going on here. When I make my (laughs) new year's resolutions, um, I don't make resolutions. I just pick like a word of the year that is just going to be like a theme that I will carry through um, and be mindful of. And so I imagine it would also be like a politic that is sort of consistent with core values that we're carrying through. Um, So when I think about the governor's budget address last week, Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, many things that struck me about it was how ideologically inconsistent it was. Mm -hmm. Um, And sort of, there was a lot of like good enough for the goose, but not good enough for the gander kind of policymaking or rhetoric really probably more than policymaking. And so um, I imagine if we were going to think about public policy the way we think about New Year's resolutions and healthy New Year's, there would also be some ideological consistency to it. So we could like really sort of test out our theories of health. Mm -hmm. So, Anne, you know, Emily made a really good point about New Year's resolutions, but I think also about health in that it can be such an individual thing. And yet policy is something that needs to cover everybody. How in policy can we balance that? Like, are there um, measures or or um, aspects that we can put into policies that would meet individual needs while covering everybody? Yeah. So just echoing what um, Emily said, I, you know, I want to say that this notion of personal responsibility is public health or is health is, it's really an idea that's antithetical to the core principles of public health. Public health is really about all of us. Um, mm-hmm. It's about solutions um, and forces that go beyond us. We know our health, um, even though there's a lot of emphasis on personal or individual choice, um, that poor health is often the reflection of constrained um, collective choices. Um, and so um, I really agree with um, what Emily said. Um, you know, when policy plays an incredibly important role in shaping those broader forces, um, I, you know, agree with Emily <laughs> like um, that we need housing for everyone. Um, we need access um, to nutritious foods. Um, healthier neighborhoods. Um, we, you know, we need to think what what are the ways that we can use policy levers um, to um, to build healthier communities um, and not just um, put the onus on individuals um, to improve their health um, or or the environment around them. Mm-hmm. Could you give us an example of? Um, well, you use this great phrase, constrained choices or constrained Mm -hmm. um because I think you know for so many people we're swimming in this water and we may not know what's not working because it's what we've always done yeah so you know I think about this you know a lot in my teaching um and I go back often to the um work of those who have looked at structural violence Mm -hmm. um or what the and this is a concept of the violence that's sort of embedded in the ordinary and the institutions um, that we have or in the day-to-day and often, um, you know, the ordinary things that lead lead to poor health. um, And, you know, we may not have access to the housing we need or um, to work that pays a meaningful wage, um, or we may live in an environment Um, that it's so degraded um, that it leads um, to poor health outcomes. And yet often we think if we change our individual behavior, we just do one thing, um, then we, you know, we can improve our health. And so um, when I think about constrained choices, I'm thinking about the way um, that broader societal forces um, shape our health. And we know um, that there are large disparities in terms of who, Um, who has access to the conditions necessary for health. One of the examples I think about in this context a lot um, is with regards to parenting and recreation and exercise um, and the way communities are structured and built. Mm. So a lot of folks, um, you know, we know that like 
folks with less resources often also have less free time. Um, and I think, you know, like we could talk about that in the context of like laundry access or just like work schedules or whatever. Um, and there's often this like real emphasis in sort of middle class normed culture around like recreating with your family. Right. And like when we recreate with our families, we all have more joy and more relaxation and more exercise. And that's good. Um, a lot of folks live in Brattleboro um, in neighborhoods where the only way to um, exercise or even like play is by getting in the car and going somewhere specifically for that activity mm -hmm. rather than it being naturally integrated into the day rather than like a safe walk to school environment where the playground is sort of on the way and you pause for 10 minutes or woods behind the house where you open the door and say, you're annoying me, get out, go play. Right. <laughs> like, um, and that an environment, a physical environment that enables like joy, recreation, exercise, fresh air uh, as part of the daily pattern of life, rather than as a chosen activity is an environment where everyone is going to have greater health, right? And it takes the onus off the individual and puts it just sort of into the flow of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would, folks, just as uh, our listeners, give give a thought to your neighborhood and look at where you do or do not have sidewalks, for example, uh, as Emily was talking about, a safe walk to, to school. Um, a lot of places are built without sidewalks. And so, you know, even for me, I'm like not an exerciser, didn't, was like not, just not, not my jam. Um, doesn't really make sense to me exercising for no reason. But when I lived in Burlington, I biked absolutely everywhere with my kid. We biked to the farm to get our produce. We biked to work, we biked to school, we biked everywhere. And so I was in really good shape because it was like a natural, it was easier mm -hmm. to ride my bicycle than to drive a car. Um, Same with me when I lived in London. Yeah. yeah. I walked everywhere. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. In Montpelier, I like go out of my way to find a place to stay during the week. That means that I have to walk to and from the state house rather than driving. Um, because otherwise I just sit in an incredibly uncomfortable chair all day. So that's like, that's just like your like sort of, you know, one-on-one, -on -one. but there's all, you know, there's food deserts, there's um, the way school lunch programs are structured, which we could certainly spend a lot of time on. Um, and I think, you know, universal school meals programs to go a long way in sort of that public health paradigm as well. Mm -hmm. So, Anne, I know you're working with, with the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, and I do want to talk about housing in the second half. But before we do that, I'd love if, you know, you've been on the show many times, but I don't know if we've ever really given listeners kind of a primer on like what is public health and what is public health policy and like how is it different than some of the the things we're talking about with like individual choice um i think sure. that might help give listeners some context um you know to avoid getting into sort of textbook definition <laughs> let me let me start with what public health isn't i think there's often a misconception that kind of public health is just an extension of clinical medicine um or our unit um of intervention or you know analysis is one or at, at the individual level public health is not just individuals multiplied um we're really thinking on the we're really thinking about um the health um health at population level and the things that we do um or the interventions um that we do at population level um to improve health um and public health is really all of us um and not um you know our and um not you know one of us um you know multiplied or exponentiated um in terms um of our action there are many different areas of public health and I'm not you know get in, gonna, going to get into that kind of nitty gritty um but public health um you know takes or the, the things that we do um to improve public health um takes many forms it's not just individual activities or behavioral changes. Um, we use policies, we use um, interventions to our, you know, our physical or our natural environment. Um, and we know um, that public health um, lives at the intersection of other sectors. You know, we're, we'll talk about housing later, but we can talk about environmental policy, um, we'll talk about education. Um, and we know that um, those things shape health, health at population level. 
Mm-hmm. Let me let me stop there. Perfect. Thank you. And when you're looking at policy and if like you're looking at the policy that say is coming out of Montpelier in this, this session, um, what are there, there aspects that you feel are, are missing from a lot of our policies that might help public health? What levers do you think people should be pulling more often? Yeah. So one thing I want to highlight, um, because it's the focus of my work, um, is equity. And, you know, and equity um, is often not the lens that we bring to our policy decisions. I think there's a great desire to think about equity kind of in a very abstract way. Um, but equity is really some a lens we need to bring to every policy decision or issue that we're looking at. We need to understand um, whether um, policies will disproportionately impact or burden um, certain groups. Are there actions we can take um, to remediate those impacts um, proactively, or do we need to make other policy choices um, to address um, those disproportionate impacts. Um, I think sometimes we think about equity as some kind of afterthought. We'll get to that after we do our real business. And I really want to say that equity is kind of the real story um, mm-hmm. and has to be built in um, to what um, we um, to what we do. So that would be probably my starting point in thinking about that. Thank you. I'm and I'm curious if you could use a sort of specific example about equity as an afterthought versus equity um, built in from the beginning. Um, sure. So I so I've done a I'm, I'll go back to public health um, and to some of the work that I've done around COVID, um, and a lot of the decisions um, that we've seen made have not really considered. Um, you know, what groups are disproportionately impacted, Mm -hmm. um, either um, because they're at greater risk of being exposed um, to um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, or transmitting it to others, or because um, they're at greater risk of experiencing adverse health outcomes. Um, And so if we look you know, at policy decisions, whether it's about vaccination um, or around distribution, um, of treatment um, or other interventions, it really means thinking about how is this decision um, going to impact those groups? What are the things that we might do to shape the trajectory of what happens? Um, you know, and what what are the and are there things that we might do to mitigate um, those those impacts? Um, I. Um, you know, think a lot about mitigation strategies that were in place. Often they didn't really consider um, what groups had been ad- most impacted um, when um, decisions were made um, to lift them across the country. Um, often the voices of those groups um, were really marginalized in the decision-making process. Um, and that has consequences um, as, as we look forward. So I'm not sure if that's the kind of example you're looking for, but. No, that's uh, great. So like thinking about folks who like work in food service and restaurants, frontline workers, folks who live in densely populated um, housing, that kind of thing. Housing, multi-generational housing. We also know, um, particularly in this phase of the pandemic, um, that people who are immunocompromised or older um, continue to be um, at risk, even though. Um, most people are at significantly lower risk going forward, but a lot of our policy mm-hmm. decisions haven't really um, started by thinking about how do we protect um, those um, who you know don't re- necessarily respond as well to vaccination or we need more support um, to be protected in this next phase of the pandemic. Um, and so if we th- bring an equity lens to that, our starting point is how do we focus on, begin by focusing on those um, who are most impacted or are most at risk. And we could you know, bring that lens to really any area um, and um, any area of policy. And so I think it demands a certain specificity in our thinking, not thinking equity, not being just a broad concept, but really um, a way of looking at the decisions that we're making um, with an, um, rigorously and um, with attention to the very specific groups um, that might be um, impacted. Thank you. So as a lawmaker, Emily, what what are you thinking about if, as far as like, okay, shifting the lens framework, shifting the different level levers we have to pull? 
like what's coming up for you right now? Um, I think we've, we began some work last biennium around actually like training people in committees to mm-hmm. be asking equity questions very specifically in the context of climate policy and the climax in the context of racial equity policy um, and in the context of labor and um, economic disparity policy. And so we sort of began to ask specific members to really learn how to ask questions about those most impacted folks um, when shaping certain policies. I There's I so much more to do in that context, absolutely. Um, and then in my individual um, hat or seat or whatever, um, wait, this is Monday morning time here and here <laughs> together. I just want all of our listeners to know that we are doing this on a Monday morning on a snow day. Um, you know, I think when I think about tax policy, um, I think about not just sort of the individual financial impacts on the person who's paying the taxes, but also a person's access to tax filing support. Um mm-hmm. And what that looks like in terms of people's ability to make the most of the system or not make the most of the system. Um, So I think about the complexity of the system um, from the perspective of the filer, not just the person who's administering the program. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I think about sort of on the flip side, where does that, um, where are those resources then distributed um, and how many people will have access to those and who needs access to those. Um, Climate policy, I think, is a really, really um, ripe place (laughs) for this kind of public health frame on equity work and hasn't been for a long time. And I don't know. um, It's really unfortunate that in Vermont, really quite explicitly, more than a lot of other areas of the country, the folks who have been focused on climate work um, tend to be wealthier, older white people. Mm -hmm. Um, Because sort of the existential threat is something else for everyone else, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, everyone else has like a more um, current and urgent thing to worry about in Vermont. In other places, we see a lot of climate um, and public health work around the environment happening in marginalized communities around pollution or access to clean water or um, highway development or all kinds of things like that. But in Vermont, it tends to be like a much more abstract Mm -hmm. conversation around solar panels. And that's really unfortunate because it means that it takes sort of extra effort here in Vermont to bring the impacts back to folks in mobile home parks in West Brattleboro who are living in a floodplain and are going to need both mitigation and prevention work done Um, or the incredibly high asthma rates that we have here because of how wood stove smoke gets trapped in households or gas stoves. Um, And so I think that when I think about sort of, you know, there's our housing work um, and our homelessness services work and how much we forget that like, poverty and poverty in Vermont begets all kinds of other problems. Mm -hmm. Um, But the other real place I think for this frame to be used is in our climate policy, where we're just talking about like tax rebates and incentives and um, not thinking big picture. Thank you, Emily. Just, we have just about four minutes before the end of this first half. Uh, Thank you, Anne. Whenever you're on the show, it always feels like it goes really quickly. Uh, with interesting conversations. Looking forward to this session or looking into this session, Anne, is there anything particularly you'll be keeping your eye on or um, you feel in this next phase of the pandemic is really important to keep an eye on? So a couple of things that I'll be keeping an eye on, um, you know, one, you know, uh, my attention right now is on po- housing policy um, because of the work that I'm I'm doing, but I'm really very interested in thinking about um, what happens to our rural institutions. Um, you know, the focus of my work is on rural health equity and has been 
Um, and, you know, our healthcare systems have been incredibly battered um, by three pandemic years. Uh, and, you know, as I talk to healthcare providers, particularly in, you know, remote um, rural parts um, of our region, you know, I'm hearing firsthand about those impacts on, you know, how workforce has been depleted, um, you know, the challenges around recruiting healthcare workers, um, and, you know, that is going to have um, impacts, you know, far into the future. And so, uh, you know, I'll be keeping um, one eye on um, what happens um, in that particular space as we think about, um, you know, our, our health system and, you know, how, um, you know, how we support rural institutions moving forward. I think it's something that um, a lot of us in the rural space, um, not only in Vermont, but nationally, um, are very concerned about. Um, we know that rural hospital closures um, have been a real problem and have acceler and accelerate, were accelerating going into the pandemic. And, um, you know, there is a lot of worry um, that we will see more of this um, in the years to come. And so while we may not see closures um, in our state, um, I, I am worried about what the impacts will be on our health systems. So that's one thing that's on that's that's just one thing that's on my mind. Oh, I think Olga is frozen. Um, yeah. I thought she was just very thoughtful. So I think um, with that, we will go to a brief break to hear from our underwriters. Yes, thank you, thank you, Emily, for jumping in there with my internet froze. <laughs> yes, the uh, Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro will return in a moment. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find us wherever you find your podcasts, as well as on BCTV. And thanks to BCTV, many of the peg stations around Vermont and a little bit around the rest of New England. Um, Emily, what do we need to remind people of? The views and opinions expressed here on the Montpelier Happy Hour are those of the host and the guests, not the station, nor their employers, friends, loved ones, neighbors. Or snow days. <laughs> if you're just joining us, folks, I'm talking with regular contributor Emily Kornheiser, who's one of three reps from the town of Brattleboro, as well as Ann Sosen, who is um, a policy fellow with the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center for Public Policy and the Social Sciences and the Interim Director for the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition. Uh, thanks for joining us, Anne. Let's jump into your work with um, the VAHC. Uh, what, you know, with all your work with public policy and public health, What's it like kind of foraying into housing policy? I want to even policy? know how did this happen to you? <laughs> <laughs> like one day you sent me a message saying you were doing this. I was like, how did you wind up, how did you wind up being the person who's doing this? So, um, so this is something that happened rather quickly at the very end of the year. Um, I, I've been interested in the intersection between health and housing um, for a long time and have collaborated with others in this space. Um, so this isn't, the first time I've thought about housing, um, but it it was not um, something that I was expecting to do, um, and um, until um, the very end of the year. But I wrote um, an opinion piece um, based on some work um, that I had been doing. Um, um, from and I think the title of that piece um, is a crisis. Um, or homelessness is a crisis, of, a crisis of housing, not um, unhousable Vermonters. Mm. Um, and then the coalition reached out um, and asked if I might be interested in considering a short-term role um, with them um, leading um, some of their work. And so that um, that's how um, this came to be. Thank you, Anne. Um, I will try to, if possible, I, I'll try to link to that opinion piece in our show notes. Um, do you happen to remember where it appeared? It so was in um, VT Digger. Mm -hmm. Good old VT Digger. Thank you. And then, Digger. Anne, what is the Affordable Housing Coalition? Who is who is coalitioning? Yeah, <laughs> the, uh, the coalition brings together more than 80 members 
um, from across the state of Vermont. It includes um, affordable housing developers, um, social service providers, um, as well as others. Um, rep, you know, across the span from homelessness all the way um, to affordable and permanent supportive housing. Thank you. And um, I, I think the title of the opinion piece you just mentioned sort of highlights some of what we've been talking about today. And, um, but I'd love if you would dive into that concept a little bit more that it sounds like in society, we have an assumption that if people are homeless, it's because they're unhousable. Um, and you're saying that's not it. I would love to hear more on that. Sure. Yeah, there are a lot of um, ideas or myths around homelessness and what causes it and as well as how responsive it is to policy interventions. Many think um, that people who are experiencing homelessness are unhousable, um, often um, because of some individual failure. Um, and we have a lot of evidence um, that that's actually not the case, um, that it's housing um, is the primary um, exp the, the primary factor that explains variation in homelessness um, across the U.S. And we also have really, really robust evidence that the vast majority of people can be housed um, if they have the right um, types of housing in place. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really have to unpack some of those myths um, and offer um, the evidence that we have um, to show that most people um, can be housed, um, but we really don't have enough housing or the right types of housing um, to meet the needs of all people um, in our state right now. Thank you. Um, when you talk about types of housing that can be as much of a problem as, as anything, would love some examples of like housing types that are working versus housing types that aren't. Yeah, so we know that just, just you know, the general landscape is that we have an enormous um, shortage of housing um, in the state of Vermont. We There's a, the most recent estimate um, that I've seen is that we need 40,000 additional units um, in our state. And so most people can um, be housed in, I guess, what we would consider conventional housing. Um, some people need um, housing with services wrapped around that, um, and subsidies um, to stay housed. Um, and so housing needs fall along a spectrum. Um, and we know um, that we need more of all types of housing um, to meet the needs of our of our state. Um, we, you know, for people um, who are experiencing chronic homelessness or who have significant needs, um, we have um, a lot of evidence um, that a housing first model um, works. Um, and we've seen that in the settings where a housing first model has been um, employed um, uh, dramatic um, reductions in homelessness. Um, the Veterans Administration or the VA employs a housing first model. Um, mm -hmm. In um, the span of two years, they saw an 11% reduction um, in um, in homelessness and in um, and a 55% reduction um, in the last decade. And so those are dramatic. Um, those are dramatic mm -hmm. improvements. Um, and, um, you know, and we need um, to look at those models that have been well tested and think about how do we bring them to scale now um, in our state. And so housing first means that someone, um, the first thing that happens when communicating with someone who is living without housing is that we find housing for them. And then all of the other perhaps um, connected challenges around employment or health care or um, social services, all those happen after the person has a safe and stable exactly. place. Exactly. Um, when it I think about that continuum. I mean, housing. Uh, it's, it's, oh, sorry, my apologies. No, go it, ahead. It first doesn't just mean housing. It means housing that is enriched with adequate, appropriate services provided, mm -hmm. you know, in a dignified way. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about sort of that continuum of housing, I just sort of want to get more explicit with examples a little bit. Some people do best in an environment that um, folks who have or living near them have committed to not using any substances. Some folks live best in a totally independent environment. Some folks live best in an environment that's close to neighbors who will be checking in on them. Some people live best in an environment where there's someone who is professionally obligated to check in on them. Um, 
some people live best in like sort of self-managed, you know, governance situations. And some live best in an environment where when they move in, they sort of sign up to a certain set of rules. And there are all of those different options available in Vermont in one form or another, but there isn't enough of a lot of them. And we have an excess right now of housing, um, large rambling farmhouses with five bedrooms and one person living in them and very little of any of the other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our housing hasn't kept up with how people's lives have changed. No. Um, so Anne, what are some of your thoughts right now about what needs to change in Vermont or what new policies we need around housing? Yeah, so I want to be really clear as I speak that, you know, you know, I'm not, you know, representing the positions of the um, the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition as I comment on this. Um, but I think, you know, we, we need to, you know, bring the solutions that we have to scale. We need very large investments um, in um, in housing right now. We also will need, and this is not my area of expertise at all, um, we need to examine some of the enabling policies um, that will allow us um, to get where we need to go with an attention to equity. Um, we want to make sure that we're um, enabling um, the right kinds of de development, but not doing so in a way that leaves um, certain groups um, behind. Um, but as we do it, um, we need to make sure that we're providing a bridge into housing um, rather than a cliff into um, homelessness um, for Vermonters who are experiencing homelessness or extreme housing precarity. And so I'm very interested um, in what happens to our emergency housing programs, as well as to mm -hmm. transitional housing um, as we make headway um, on solving um, the larger um, crisis of housing. Can you mm -hmm. describe um, more explicitly sort of the difference between a bridge and a cliff? Yeah, so we know that we don't have enough housing right now um, to house all Verm uh, to house all Vermonters, um, including those experiencing homelessness. And so we need temporary solutions um, in place um, until we expand um, the stock of housing um, or appropriate housing um, to to meet their needs. Um, and right now, um, the state. Um, is using shelters. It's also using, um, th th it has the GA emergency housing program or the use of motels as temporary housing um, in place. Um, and we need to make sure um, that we don't dismantle um, those programs um, before we have enough um, in the way of housing um, to rehouse people. Mm -hmm. And I think Emily, when we were talking to Stephanie Yu from the Public Assets Institute, didn't she point out that there are more Vermonters homeless now than was it before the pandemic? I don't remember what the benchmark was, but yeah, it was before the pandemic. Yeah, that house homelessness has increased in Vermont. Yes. Yeah. So, and so like go ahead. Yeah. So just one comment that I will make um, is that there's a lot of invisibility um, around homelessness and housing and precarity. Um, and so we, it's not clear to what extent homelessness has ex increased versus that we have a much better count of Vermonters who are um, experiencing homelessness and housing precarity. You know, the face of rural homelessness is often couch surfing or doubling up. Or um, sleeping in a car sleeping in a car. Um, and so we have a better census right now. Um, and, and we understand um, the needs of um, that particular population better. Um, but it doesn't mean that that increase only reflects um, an increase um, in homelessness. Also want to add, um, and DC, every time I am in a housing meeting with folks from the Department of Children and Families, um, they also like this is a very important data for them. This doesn't mean that it's the same folks who have been without housing for the entire pandemic. Right. It's yes. not that, right? There's been a lot of people who have found permanent and semi-permanent semi housing since the beginning of the pandemic. And there have been a lot more people who have lost their housing during the pandemic. And so... Um, this is like a constantly flowing, changing environment of humans struggling. Um, and I know that the Housing Coalition, um, especially the um, 
homeless provider network, homeless services provider network, and the capstone, the um, community action agencies sort of put forward some thoughts around um, what transitional housing looked like. And I don't mean um, what that bridge could be between where we are now and what permanent housing for everyone would look like. And that's something that I feel like folks are having a really hard time getting their heads around right now in the context mm-hmm. of legislation. So mm-hmm. we know that the motel programs um, aren't working um, completely and that the supply of motel rooms seems to be shrinking. For some reason, I don't actually quite understand. Um, and maybe that's not even true, but it certainly has now like truth in the zeitgeist. Um, and we know it's going to take a long time to build enough permanent housing for everyone. So what do those we know? And we also know that like sort of the old model of seasonal shelters where someone just has like a mat on the floor or a cot just for the night and has to leave during the day doesn't work. And so what is like, what's that thing that we do while we're trying to figure out the next thing? Yeah. So the, so I want to just say something about the motel program. And the first is that, you know, mo- we're often asking the motels to be something that they're not. I think there's often evaluated as though they're, you know, permanent supportive housing yes. um, when right. really they're motels. Um, and some <laughs> of them have, you know, you know, better services wrapped around them than others. Um, but motels are still a better option um, than unsheltered homelessness. Um, and, you know, and we should, I think, collectively say um, that unsheltered homelessness is just not acceptable in 2023 in the state of Vermont. Um, and so, you know, we want to preserve that and then also define what role that might that play as emergency housing um, moving forward, because we know um, that there will always be some need, um, even when we make a lot of progress in our housing crisis, um, for um, for emergency housing, um, for episodic um, homelessness. Um, in terms of thinking about transitional options, I think we need a lot of creativity um, around the options that we employ. Um, they're not you know, tons of great options. I've heard, you know, we know that there are pods that are being used um, in Burlington. We know that there have been motel conversions um, that have been done um, in some places. So some groups have bought motels and converted them into um, temporary or transitional housing or even permanent housing. Um, And so that is one practice. Um, Campuses um, that are empty might be another option that we see, Um, but really we need very creative thinking um, in place um, to define realistic solutions um, that we can use um, until we have um, much more housing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, and it sounds like we often hear the example of that Emily used of the five bedroom farmhouse with one person living in it. We also need solutions to allow people to move out of those farmhouses if if they can. You know, some people are still in those farmhouses because they don't have anywhere else to go. Um that they can afford or or um, is in their community. Mm-hmm. Right. And it becomes a real challenge for older Vermonters um, when there's not, um, you know, an appropriate next option. I mean, many are looking to downsize or move closer in um, to a town center. And those options um, are not, you know, the, we, or we don't have enough of those options um, yet to enable um, that transition and to allow housing to turn over. And that's something that, you know, there's been a little bit of reporting around, um, but it's, um, you know, th- that's another, it's it's another gap. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, Emily, I believe, was it a week or two ago, um, there was policy and I, forgive me, I don't know where it is in the process, but there was a lot of conversations around zoning mm-hmm. um, as one of the solutions to our, our housing crisis. Um, where are those conversations? So again, we're three weeks into the legislative session now. And so no, there aren't any conversations that are really pretty much anywhere other than in can't cut bills on the wall, basically. Um, but there was a bill introduced um this week and referred to committee um that moves Vermont to a much more sort of um base ma- um inclusionary zoning model 
-hmm. that um that inclusionary zoning makes sure that towns can't discriminate around um, plot size um, around parking restrictions um, around actually shelters um, shelter siting it's good work it's necessary work it's not it's all things that Brattleboro has done already, and we're still in the position we're in here. So it's like not anywhere close to enough to solve the problem. It's one piece of a puzzle that involves um, also a lot more dollars into the system. And it needs to be dollars. You know, right now we have development dollars available, but we have groundworks to use the Wyndham County example. We have groundworks and Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust both, you know, our affordable housing um, developer and mm -hmm. our um, homeless services provider, both at human capacity levels that are stretched as mm -hmm. as they possibly can be. So neither of those agencies were sort of tasked by the um, by default with solving this problem for us, a problem that is all of our problem. Mm -hmm. um, have the capacity to do really do one more thing at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the next step is to make sure that we are matching the resources, um, both going to these agencies to do planning work, to hire folks, um, to think creatively, to collaborate deeply. We have to make sure all of that is resourced adequately from both a human level and a dollars level. Um, and then again, we need to think about what development do we want to fund at what time scale to actually get us through this period in our history. Mm -hmm. So we are investing in a lot of in some building, long-term building of housing. We are um diversifying that somewhat from sort of the standard model of the Wind and Windsor, Windsor Housing Trust project that did not involve any services connected to it. But we have not done as a state at all the strategic planning we need to do to say like how are we going to get from a to c and make sure that not that we don't lose thousands of people during b right like there's no conversation about that timeline and mm. how many people are impacted at each stage of that timeline and by what policy decisions we might be making and that just like makes my head want to explode with frustration <laughs> And I see you nodding. Uh, I, I think that there are a couple of things that we need kind of, you know, at state level, you know, one is a really comprehensive, you know, state roadmap or state vision for where we want to go and um, the investments and policies that we need in place to get there. You know, I always looking for that. The other thing is um, I don't see kind of at state level the interagency coordination that has been put in place and other um, and other settings that have really said, um, you know, this is something that is priority number one, um, and we need to bring all of our resources to bear upon it in a coordinated way. And so I'm hoping that there's some thought about that as well. I looked at, you know, at the example of California, and California has, you know, recognized um, that their homelessness and housing has reached crisis levels, and um, they've really brought a crisis mentality to bear upon that. Um, it's going to take a long time to solve the problem there, just as it is here, um, you know, but see that, you know, the planning um, and the coordination that's being put in place um, is really um, what we need. Um, we need, you know, solutions and a response that's commensurate with the scale of the crisis that we're facing um, um, if we're going to, um, if we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. So, and I want, you know, to put sort of finer detailed points on those kinds of things. Um, the administration talks a lot about how, you know, we need to reform our zoning and our planning and all of that because it's a barrier to development. But what we don't see is the idea that there would be folks whose jobs in the administration would be to coordinate all of the regulatory pieces of housing development and to ease someone's path through that, right? Mm -hmm. Like we have that on the financial services level. There are people in state government who, in someone who, when a business is trying to navigate a massive piece of the financial services system, say a captive insurance company trying to set up, you know, a company trying to set up a captive insurance within Vermont. We have folks whose job it is to walk someone through that process to make sure that 
every step along the way, they are being supported in navigating the regulatory structure and they have transparency about what comes next. They have the resources they need. There's someone there to guide them through any hiccups. On the housing development level, we have say in Brattleboro, you know, the Winston Prouty Center, who is ready, willing and able to build like 600 units on their property, um, have all the planning done. But there is no one in the state bureaucracy who says, let me help you through the ANR process. Let me make sure that everyone at the Agency of Natural Resources understands what needs to happen here, that all of the folks who have dollars attached to them at the Agency of Human Services and at the Agency of Commerce, there's no place where all of that is integrated at all. The private nonprofit sector side of this in terms of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency and the Vermont Housing Conservation Board, they have now set a table where someone can go there and sort of pitch everything all at once for them. But at the state level, the kind of coordination and collaboration has not occurred yet. And the idea of sort of a positive regulatory framework that someone is assisted in moving through is so far from reality. And so it's left up to individual solutions um, again, which is not what public health is, to really get this done. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, and um, rant over. <laughs> well, no, I think you bring up a really good point because how that echoes for me as as we've mentioned for listeners, I'm I'm working for um, Stevenson Associates, which is architecture, engineering, as well as MS development, which is uh, develop you know development. Um, and more in the for-profit realm. And it brings back for me, a couple of my colleagues went up to Burlington at the same time, there were some conferences. One was, um, I think they called it the Affordable Housing Conference. I, I can't remember, this was back in November. And then the day after was the Vermont Developers Conference. And what my colleagues noticed, noticed is they went to both conferences. So one was mostly nonprofit, one was mostly for-profit housing. But what they noticed was that very few people went to both. That here were some people who are so dedicated to improving housing in Vermont, and yet they were at the ground level, were not talking to each other. Um, and so I, it sounds to me with what you were sharing, Emily, a little bit like a coordination issue all the way through every, all strata of housing in, in Vermont. Um, and again, it's not just about building the housing. There's a mm -hmm. lot more that needs to happen. And there's a lot more organizations that need to be resourced if this is going to work, especially in the interim period between now and some magic time when we have, you know, thousands and thousands more units of permanent housing. It, the, the one thing that I would add to that, too, is that we really need to adequately um, resource the service providers as well. Yes. It's not just about adding units. It's also about adequately supporting people um, so that they stay housed in those units. Um, and so um, we need large investments in that um, to make sure um, that people are, not, you know, once housed, remain there. Um, we want, you know, we want to stably um, house Vermonters, um, not just, um, you know, not just check off the number that we've added um, you know, to our current stock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anne. Uh, just a couple minutes left before we, we need to say goodbye. Anything else you want to leave listeners with before we do that, Anne? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, something that I, um, I've been trying to figure out myself down here is I have folks who, um, there are a lot of folks in Brattleboro and the surrounding areas, and I think statewide, who want to have a hand in solving this problem um, and are sort of coming up with new solutions on their own um, in a very complex system, public health environment, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I just want to offer to folks that to really recommend that if this is something that you're interested in, you can certainly you know, sign up for updates with the Affordable Housing Coalition, um, as well as be in touch with your the housing services provider in your community to see what would be helpful to them. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. Um, and if people want to learn more about the Vermont Affordable Housing Coalition, where can they go? They can go to um, the coalition's website, 
Um, and there's more information about the coalition as well um, as the legislative priorities for this session there. Great. And Thank what you. is, do you know the URL for the website? Is it vahc.org or something? It is um, vtaffordablehousing.org. Ah, thank Thanks. you. And Emily, if people want to um, learn more about you, where can they go? They can go to emilykornheiser.org, where you will find links to my email address and my newsletter sign up and all kinds of fun things. The website has not been updated in a little bit because I um, can't seem to get my password reset. Oh, no. But all the links to all the things that are regularly updated are right there at emilykornheiser.org. Wonderful. And as always, the Montpelier Happy Hour is on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station every Friday at 2 p.m., as well as wherever you find your podcasts. And you can always go to our Captivate page as well, or drop us an email at the Montpelier Happy Hour at gmail.com. Take care, everyone. Have a good weekend.